Hello and welcome to the Point of Care podcast. Today's episode is on acute decompensated heart failure. Please note that while diuresis is an integral part of treating acute decompensated heart failure in the hospital, that is not going to be the focus of today's episode. We'll instead focus on the process of admitting a patient, crafting your assessment, thinking through GDMT, and touching on key clinical pearls for day-to-day practice. If you want to become a diuresis master, check out the separate episode from May of 2023 dedicated entirely to inpatient diuresis, which we'll link off to in the show notes. As a background, HEF-REF, or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, is defined by an ejection fraction of less than 40%, and it indicates impaired contractility of the heart muscle, resulting in reduced pumping efficiency. By contrast, HEF-PEF, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, is an ejection fraction of 50% and higher, and this indicates impaired relaxation or stiffness of the heart muscle that results in diastolic dysfunction. HEF-IMPF is used to imply a HEF-REF that has improved with an EF of greater than 40% with GDMT and should be treated like HEF-REF. hef MREF is a newer classification for mid-range or mildly reduced EF between 40 and 49%. Acute decompensated heart failure is the most common cause of hospitalizations in patients above the age of 65 in the United States and accounts for greater than 1 million annual hospitalizations in the U.S. For those with moderate to high diuretic use at home, median lengths of stay for acute decompensated heart failure is about 5 days, and the median time alive and out of the hospital without an ED visit or readmission is about 50 days. Medications that improve outcomes are considered guideline-directed medical therapy, or GDMT, and they include beta blockers, ACE ARBs and ARNIs, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists like spironolactone, and SGLT2 inhibitors. Diuretics and digoxin improve symptoms but do not improve mortality. The five-year survival is 25% after a patient's been hospitalized for HEFREF and acute decompensated heart failure. When you're admitting a patient with acute decompensated heart failure, for your checklist, start with the ABCs. You should immediately distinguish between warm versus cold and wet versus dry. Cold patients may be in shock and require the ICU for inotropes, pressors, and in some cases a swan catheter to trend chemos and help guide treatment. Wet and warm patients are bread and butter heart failure and will need aggressive diuresis on the floor. You should be considering the ICU if the patient's SBP is less than 90 for more than 30 minutes. Tachycardia can also be a sneaky sign of shock. Note if they're on beta blockers because this compensatory response might be blunted. You should ask yourself if they have pulmonary edema and require BiPAP. You should ask yourself if you're concerned about ACS and whether or not the patient needs a left heart cath. And you should also be asking whether they need a right heart cath and a swan to help guidance of your treatment. For your chart check, look for the patient's last echo, their recent decompensations, their home medicine regimen, and their fill history. For their HPI intake, ask them about their baseline functioning. How many city blocks do they think they can walk without stopping? And can they go up a flight of stairs? Ask about their dry weight, if they know it or look it up in the chart, noting that this might not be terribly reliable, but will give you a good baseline to start with. Ask about the timing and severity of their symptoms, including dyspnea on exertion, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, orthopnea, and lower extremity edema. Ask them about their home regimen and adherence. Ask them what meds they're taking, when do they take them, and who helps them with their medication regimen. One way I found to ask patients about their regimen without being judgmental is to state plainly, sometimes some of my patients have trouble taking their medicines. On any given month, how many doses do you think that you miss? You should also ask them about their diet and salt intake and NSAID use. They probably won't know what that means, so ask about over-the-counter medicines for pain. Things that you can't miss include cardiogenic shock, so look for a lactate, a narrow pulse presser, whether they're cold on exam, have a low BP, and if they're tachycardic. Also can't miss pulmonary edema that leads to hypoxic respiratory failure. When you're placing your admission orders, make sure you ask for daily weights, strict I's and O's, telemetry, send an NT pro BNP 
iron studies, get a new EKG, and make sure you get a chest x-ray. There's some controversy over sodium-restricted diets and fluid restrictions, but in general, that tends to be common practice, especially if the patient is severely hyponatremic or has severe heart failure. Your initial treatment to consider includes IV diuretics at two times the patient's home dose, thinking about the need for afterload reduction if there's hypertension or pulmonary edema, continuing the beta blockers, ACE and ARBs, and spironolactone if the patient's blood pressure and renal function allows, and whether or not the patient might need IV iron if they qualify, which we'll talk more about later. For your assessment, you should be thinking about what is this patient's ACCAHA stage, a is a patient that has risk factors. Stage B is they have structural changes but no symptoms. C is that they have symptoms. And D is refractory or terminal. The NYHA class is class 1 is no limitations on activity. Class 2 is symptoms with normal activity. Class 3 is symptoms with minimal activity. And class 4 is symptoms at rest. And the reason you should be asking yourself which stage in class the patient is, is because it has an impact on how you treat them. The etiology of decompensations include dietary, medication adherence, ischemia, arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, hypertension, medications like NSAIDs and steroids, infections, and drugs like alcohol or cocaine. On exam, looking at the pulse pressure. A narrow pulse pressure is a sign of low output and increased mortality. It's considered narrow if the pulse pressure divided by the systolic blood pressure is less than 0.25. Crackles are not specific. You should instead rely more on your volume assessment and symptoms like orthopnea. The S3 heart sound is a specific acute decompensated heart failure exam finding. It's a ventricular gallop, Kentucky, this happens during passive filling of the left ventricle and blood that strikes the compliant left ventricle. It's usually present in heart failure, but can also be a normal finding in young patients, especially those who are pregnant or have high cardiac output for other reasons. It's best heard with the bell at the cardiac apex, and as I said before, has a likelihood ratio of 11 and is highly specific but not sensitive. It's believed to result from the oscillation of blood against the ventricular wall during rapid filling. JVP can be done sitting completely up, and it's considered elevated if you see it above the clavicle, or at 30 to 45 degrees. Ask the patient to turn their head and look at the right side of their neck. Look for the double bounce and make sure it's not actually the carotid, and you can feel the pulse and see if it's the carotid. You can also attempt hepatojugular reflux, and that's a positive sign if it stays elevated for 10 or more seconds. POCUS can be especially useful for differentiating between COPD exacerbation and acute decompensated heart failure. You can look at the heart to approximate the squeeze, look at the lungs to look for edema, which includes three or more B lines in two or more lung zones, and you can also assess the intravascular volume looking at the IVC, seeing if the diameter is greater than 2 centimeters and collapses less than 50% with respiration. Pitting edema is graded based on the depth of depression and the time to rebound. I never remember what the actual distinctions are, so I just remember that it's considered 3 plus if it stays pitting for 60 plus seconds. So I either say it's 2 plus or less or 3 plus or higher, and it kind of gives me a sense of whether things are improving or not. For your plan, when you're working up, follow up on the EKG, the troponins, the NT Pro BNP, the magnesium, iron studies, and lactate. You only should get an echo if you're concerned for clinical or functional change, or there's been a while since you got the last echo. You should be getting a daily CBC, BMP, and magnesium, and repleting to get potassium over 4 and magnesium over 2, and those will all go down potentially when you're diuresing, and it might get in the way of you diuresing aggressively. You should have strict eyes and O's, daily weights, and continuous telemetry. If it's a new diagnosis of heart failure, an ischemic workup includes an EKG, a troponin, a stress test, or a left heart cath. The non-ischemic workup includes lipids, hemoglobin A1c, iron studies, an ANA, a rheumatoid factor, HIV, SPEP, UPEP, and serum-free light change, and a TSH with free T4. If it's still after this initial workup a complete mystery, 
or you have high suspicion for cardiac sarcoid or amyloidosis, you can get a cardiac MRI or PET. For treatment, be thinking about your O2 goal, making sure they stay over 90%. You should do non-invasive positive pressure ventilation if you're concerned about acute pulmonary edema. For the preload, you should be thinking about diuresis, mostly with loop diuretics. Be very clear about what you're diuresing with, what your goal net negative is over the next 24 hours. Again, you start with two times the home dose, and you might need to do it higher if the patient has CKD. Remember that the conversion is 40 milligrams of PLA6 is equal to 10 to 20 of PO torsamide, which is equal to 1 milligram PO of Bumex. You can switch to PO when the patient's symptoms are resolving and their JVP and edema are improving. You think they're closer to their dry weight. For afterload, medicines like isosorbide dinitrate or mononitrate, hydralazine, and captopril can be used to lower the blood pressure. This is usually done in severe hypertension if you're concerned that the patient has pulmonary edema. For inotropy, this is really only if the patient is cold and is going to the ICU. You can think about inodilators like dobutamine or milrinone, or inopressors like dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Beta blockers include carvedilol and metoprolol, and we'll talk about those in a bit, but those should be continued inpatient as long as the patient's not in cardiogenic shock. For ACE, ARB, and ARNIs, you should continue them inpatient unless there's a significant AKI or hyperkalemia. You should be thinking about switching to an ARNI if they're in class 2 or 3 patient. For mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, if they're NYHA class 2 through 4, as long as their creatinine clearance is above 30 and their potassium is less than 5, you should also be thinking about whether they should be getting it if they have HEF-PEF, though that's a little bit controversial, which we'll talk about later. SGLT2 inhibitors like dipagliflozin and empagliflozin should be given in patients who have an EF less than 35% regardless of whether or not they have diabetes. Iron can be given to patients if their ferritin is less than 100 or their ferritin is less than 300 and their SAT is less than 20%, or if their iron alone is less than 13 You should consider placement of an ICD after 3 to 6 months of GDMT if they're grade B and have an ejection fraction less than 30%, or grade C and have an EF less than 35%, or if they've ever had prior VT or VFib. You should be considering cardiac resynchronization therapy if they're grade C with an EF less than 35% and a QRS greater than 150, for example, if they have a bundle branch block, or if the patient needs pacing, perhaps due to bradycardia. We'll save the advanced therapies and mechanical circulatory support for the cardiogenic shock episode, but those are impellas, balloon pumps, left ventricular assist devices, and in the most severe cases, transplant. For some pearls, acute decompensated heart failure is unlikely if the NT pro BNP is less than 300 with a negative predictive value of 98%. It's considered very likely if the NT pro BNP is greater than 900 and the patient is over 50 years old. They might be falsely low in obese patients and less useful in CKD patients, especially those on dialysis. Previous literature has suggested that NT pro BNP alone is better than clinical judgment alone when you're trying to diagnose acute decompensated heart failure. If the NT pro BNP goes down less than 30% with your diuresis, they're much higher risk of future decompensations. Many patients with acute decompensated heart failure will present with a pre-renal AKI due to low effective circulating volume and decreased GFR. Because when you diurese, it takes some time to mobilize third-spaced fluid and the effective circulating volume might go down, leading to a lower GFR and increased creatinine. More often than not, This does not represent damage to the kidney, but is rather reflective of the change in hemodynamics. If you want to protect the kidney, the goal is to get to euvolemia, and the GFR should improve with normalized effective circulating volume. So trust your physical exam. One way to check if a dose of diuretic is working is to check a spot urinary sodium, and if it's above 100, that dose was effective. Hyponatremia, especially sodium levels less than 125, is an individual predictor of mortality in acute decompensated heart failure. And it's important to recognize that heart failure is a terminal disease. 
Cardiac transplant is the only cure, but a majority of patients are not candidates. So if they're not a candidate for an LVAD or a transplant, you should be getting palliative care involved early in their course. For some treatment pearls, dry cough in ACE inhibitors is due to pulmonary accumulation of bradykinin and is not dose-dependent, but it is a class effect for all ACE inhibitors. You should dose-reduce ACE ARBs and ARNIs if the GFR decreases greater than 30% or hyperkalemia develops after you start those medicines. It's pretty rare to see a drop in blood pressure when you start a medicine like spironolactone or a plerinone, and you should feel free to add it on even if there's not a lot of blood pressure room. 30-50% to 50 of heart failure patients are iron deficient. IV iron decreases symptoms, increases functional capacity, and increases quality of life, and should be considered in all patients that come in. PO iron is ineffective in patients with heart failure, thought likely due to high hepcidin levels that block intestinal absorption. For some trials in literature, the Be Convinced trial showed that stopping versus continuing home beta blockers when you're admitted for acute decompensated heart failure showed no change in outcomes inpatient. However, if you continued the beta blocker inpatient, you were more likely to be taking it three months after admission, and this is 90% versus 76% if you stopped it. And obviously, we'd like patients to stay on their beta blocker long term. You should pretty much continue to get all of the GDMT if your blood pressure and renal function will allow it. You show better one-year mortality if you add GDMT while in the hospital, and worse one-year mortality if you take something away. We won't go into too much detail on the various trials and literature, but I did want to state something about HEF-PEF. HEF-PEF is a much more heterogeneous disease compared to HEF-REF and it's difficult to target the various mechanisms that lead to and promote diastolic dysfunction and the many associated comorbidities. Because of this, GDMT is just absent or completely different in these patients because many trials have shown up to be negative. So if you remember nothing else, remember that acute decompensated heart failure is the most common reason for inpatient admission for adults in the United States. You need to ensure that the patient is not in cardiogenic shock Provided the patient's heart function is at baseline and they're simply overloaded, the mainstay of treatment is aggressive diuresis. Diuresis based on a combination of their symptoms, your volume exam, weight, and labs. Continue diuresing through mild elevations in creatinine as it rarely indicates an intrinsic AKI in most situations. If the patient's not responding to higher doses of loop diuretics, switch to a drip or augment with thiazide diuretics. Replenish K and magnesium to not fall behind with diuresis. Continue and or uptitrate the patient's GDMT while they're admitted to set them up for success upon discharge. Instruct the patient to call their PCP or cardiologist if they notice worsening lower extremity edema or gain 3 to 5 pounds over 3 to 4 days. Note that in this episode, I chose to forego going into too much detail about the dosing of different medicines and that's mostly just because we have an excellent graphic at pointofcaremedicine.com in the acute decompensated heart failure page that you can refer to if you have questions about the starting dose, the max or goal dose, and when you should be holding them, as well as the trials that we use as evidence to support their use. That's all for this episode. Check out pointofcaremedicine.com to see the templates we discussed, as well as the pearls, literature, and links to other resources.